Uh, but I've known Lauren Todd for many years, um, and and she's done really just wonderful work, primarily kind of in the area of uh, 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 the dynamics of kind of uh, malaria, um, and then also kind of um, uh, looking at, at multiple kind of scales um, to go along with this um, IDAS uh, program, uh, um, within host modeling as well as kind of between host modeling. Um, she, uh, let me see if I can get all this right. Um, she did her uh, undergraduate work. Um, at Cornell University, um, and then moved on to um, uh, postdocs at, at um, Harvard in the Center for Infectious Disease Dynamics. Did I say it? Communicable Infectious Disease? Communicable Disease Dynamics? Acronyms. And then also at Georgia Tech um, with Joshua White's um, a second postdoc. First, it reversed. Reverse. Um, and um, and she has over the last few years been a faculty member in the Department of Math at Virginia Tech, um, where she has, I just learned this morning, um, she's gone through the tenure process in the last year. Um, so congratulations. Yes. And um, yeah, she's she's just developed some really nice models to look at um, within and between those dynamics um, of the infectious pathogens, um, um, focus on, on Malaria, but not exclusively. Um, and luckily, we will not hear about SARS CoV 2. Thanks, Katia. So, <laughs> very impressive introduction given the, especially given the time, because we got all, all my pieces there. Um, yeah, so I'm going to talk about malaria today, and I'm going to talk about sort of two different stories. Hopefully, we'll see if we get to both of them. Um, and I, I'm, I am in a mathematics department, so I know our culture is a little bit different there. I welcome questions throughout the talk, so if you want to interrupt me at any point, um, if that's perfectly fine. The other thing is there, there are a few equations in here. Don't be too afraid. I'll, I'll talk to you about them. And you know, I, I put them in there because there's a lot of uh, a lot of interpretability with them as well. So just to um, just to give you an idea, like I like to think about malaria across a lot of different scales. Um, and so from all the way from the host pathogen uh, within host interactions with the you know, very complicated life cycle flash up there briefly a little bit later as well, to all the way up to the sort of regional and international spread. And today I'm going to talk about two aspects. One that's more on the ecological side and thinking about mosquito, mosquitoes and changing interventions towards mosquitoes and how that will impact malaria and transmission. And one is more on sort of the combination within host, between host idea of uh, development of immunology or immunological protection uh, towards the parasite and how that changes spread. So just to give you sort of a little bit of crash course background here, then for the, when we talk about malaria, it's still a problem in a lot of places around the world. So the map I've put up here kind of gives you the areas where we see a lot of malaria. Um, and there's more, there's about 250 million cases a year. So if you want to put that on a scale, that's about two out of every three people in the US, the equivalent of that getting malaria in a year. And so a lot of people are dying, but mostly, which are mostly children under the age of five. Uh, and a lot of that is happening in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, while we don't really have malaria transmission in the U.S. anymore, we did about you know, 80, 100 years ago. And if you're interested, the Walt Disney made a uh, nice public uh, service announcement that you can Google and look up. It's about a nine-minute video called The Wing Scourge, talking about the Anopheles mosquito and how it transmits malaria and what you can do. Um, so I, I highly recommend that. But, you know, they did it to help protect and you know, provide information to people in the US. So a little bit about the biology of malaria. So it's a very complicated to host life cycle. It requires the Anopheles mosquito um, and a vertebrate host. I will entirely focus on a, a particular species, Plasmodium falciparum, and the vertebrate host of humans. And Plasmodium falciparum is only one of five uh, species that can infect humans, but it's the one that's responsible for most of the mortality and morbidity that we see specifically in sub-Saharan Africa, but also around the world. Um, so everything I talk about will be in the context of that pathogen here, if you are the malaria specific. Um, most of the symptoms that we see um, are sort of the hallmark symptoms of malaria that include like cyclical fevers or anemia, all happen during one part of the um, the life cycle that happens when it's the parasite lives within the human red blood cell. And uh, another part of another reason this is such an important stage is that it's one of it's the longest stage that we see. So the parasite can live in those sort of repeatedly infecting red blood cells 
for weeks, months, and even years that we know of. So it's the longest stage that we see, and then it, it sort of goes through this like liver, blood, mosquito, liver, blood, mosquito cycle that we're seeing. Don't worry about all of the specific terminology. I won't be using those uh, today, but just to give that idea. Um, and we when we talk about immunity to malaria, we're usually talking about sort of immunity to, to disease rather than immunity against infection. Um, and we uh, individuals acquire that immunity typically over the process of multiple exposures. And so when I talk about the, immuno the immunity project that we're working with, I will go a little bit more into depth about that idea, but really not any immunological depth, but the idea of how that protects itself. Up. So mathematical models have been a, um, a tool that has been used for over 100 years to think about uh, malaria transmission. So Ronald Ross sort of had the Hallmark model back in 1911 that really uh, used this idea of compartmental modeling to think about um, how can we try to stop malaria transmission. And so this is a little bit more expanded than the original model. Uh, it's sort of the hallmark, what we call Ross McDonald model of malaria transmission. So George McDonald in the 1950s sort of added some components to it. But what we have is that we've divided our humans into two sort of disease status boxes, susceptible and infection, and our mosquitoes into three, susceptible, infected, and then infectious. And obviously the level of infectious mosquitoes impacts transmission within the humans and the level of infectious humans impacts transmission in the, in the mosquito population. And we sort of have that um, cycle that we're working on. It's a really general sort of compartmental model that we're thinking about. And, you know, there's a lot of underlying assumptions that go into it. And so there was a really nice paper um, about a decade ago at this point that looked at all the mathematical models from 1970 to 2010, looking at vector borne diseases and sort of the proliferation of what that is. You'll notice there's a lot of malaria modeling model papers. But one of the things that was really apparent is that even though there's been this proliferation in papers and like research looking at malaria using mathematical models, a lot of the individual variation is still neglected. And so that's one of the things that I've been really interested in building into um, these models is that individual variation. And one of the neat things that that paper did um, is they created something called the Ross McDonald index, which was how many assumptions that the Ross McDonald model made did you really change in the papers? Um, and you'll you'll see that the mode here is at one, but you know <laughs> the distribution is really low. And you know, honestly, I'm sure it, I probably didn't have any malaria papers before 2000, but you know, I'm sure my papers would fall somewhere in maybe a little bit shifted. But the idea is that there's still a lot to do, a lot of variation that we can build in in this. But one of the things that these models did, these very simplistic models did show, is that efforts to control the mosquito population were going to be really a good direction to go. And that's why back in the 1950s, the WHO's Global Malaria Eradication Program really focused on controlling the mosquitoes, um, but often through methods that maybe aren't the most ecologically responsible. <laughs> so here is a image of them fogging DDT on the beach with people just there. So these efforts were successful in many places, um, including in the US. Um, but they were stopped for some reason, but also once they the once they were stopped, malaria returned to certain areas. And that's going to be, you know, related to sort of the environment, somewhat of the environmental context that's happening there as well. Uh, just how easy was it to really eliminate the mosquito species? But this idea of mosquito population control has been really uh, useful and important into understanding uh, what's happening and how to control the malaria transmission. So more recently, a lot of mosquito population control has been through insecticides and insecticides that are approved in close proximity to human use, but also in bed nets. However, at this point, a lot of the mosquito populations, specifically, I'll be talking about something here in Africa, show insecticide resistance. So the map that I'm showing here is, you know, all the, a lot of locations where they've tested for insecticide resistance, um, all those sort of little bubbles on this map. And the ones that have, that are colored red are considered fully resistant populations. The ones that are orange are partially resistant and the ones that are green are considered still susceptible. And you'll notice that there's a lot of red on this map. So a lot of populations that are considered uh, insecticide resistant. So uh, in, you know, 
there, there's been an effort to think about other ways that we can intervene with mosquito populations. And so a group that I worked with at Harvard had some really nice ideas about replacing or adding to insecticides. Um, these two, these are two ideas that I'm going to talk about, which we actually use the same sort of modeling technique to consider. And so the first, the first is thinking about a specific form of mosquito hormone, 20E, and um, that has a lot of effects on the mosquito itself. It's known to be involved in mosquito reproduction, uh, but it also has impacts on longevity and, as it turns out, susceptibility to um, Plasmodium falciparum. Um, so the, the work that I'm going to talk, to talk about today is using a mimic to that hormone, which I will call DBH, uh, throughout. And then the other idea they had is rather, you know, rather than trying to use this um, mimic to the hormone, what could we think about actually employing uh, antimalarial drugs that are already out there? And so in particular, um, I'll be talking about the tovaquone, which is a drug, drug that many people get prescribed as a prophylactic when they go to a malaria endemic country. And so the idea was, you know, the, the parasite is the same parasite in the human and the mosquito. Can we in, use what we know works to kill the parasite in the human in within the mosquito uh, to kill the parasite as well? So I'll be doing this through a discrete model of um, thinking, tracking the mosquito population. And so we we are going to divide the mosquitoes up by age, and age being measured in one day increments. And then we're going to sort of lead them through their life cycle in terms of eggs, larvae, pupa, and then adults doing different things, such as mating, feeding, resting, egg laying, and so forth. Um, we're going to parameterize the um, components of this related to experimental lab data on the mosquitoes. Um, and then we're going to consider sort of different settings, whether that be the intervention coverage or the insecticide resistance that we're working on. So just to give you some background on the experimental data, so we know that we it was determined in um, the lab that TBH alters specific mosquito traits. So in all the figures that I'm showing, um, control is on the left and then increasing um, level of DPH to the right. And so we see a reduction in egg laying uh, with higher concentrations of DPH. We see a reduction in mating with the higher concentrations of DPH. We see uh, reductions in uh, longevity or enhancements in mortality with the higher levels of DPH. Uh, so these are all things that alter the uh, sort of mosquito traits that we're working with. Um, but it also shows a really strong reduction in susceptibility to um, malaria as well with those higher levels of GPH. So we wanted to think about incorporating these into our model and see how what the impacts are. And so the first thing that we did is we incorporated those first three effects that are totally independent of malaria and said, how does this affect the total mosquito population? So in the figure that I have here, um, sort of our baseline uh, level with no intervention is the the flat black curve, and then we're we're looking at everything relative to that baseline intervention, and we consider three levels, three dose levels of DDH, and then three levels of insecticide, um, uh, sort of insecticide resistance. So how effective is insecticide? And the the more solid curves are sort of the higher levels, either like more effective insecticide or higher levels of DDH here. And so uh, for all of the ecologists in the room or that are thinking about mosquitoes, you might be like, ah, oh, more, we've introduced more mosquitoes with this idea, um, which is in fact what we uh, thought about initially. And so X axis here is sort of the coverage of the intervention. You could think about this as like what percentage of individuals are having, or like what fraction of individuals are having fitness. Um, I will say this is a mean field model, so ignore near zero and ignore near 100%. The model's not going to be true to form there when you see the different dynamics. But one of the things that we really see is that, okay, well, insecticide always is reducing the total mosquito population as we expect, even when there is some level of resistance. Our DBH interventions seem to always be increasing the population, which could be concerning. But as it turns out, if we look at the not only does it change the total population, but it really changes the age composition of the population. And so what we're seeing is there's many more younger mosquitoes um, and slightly fewer older mosquitoes. I've highlighted down here the days that we would expect to be sort of the potential transmitting days because there's actually a relatively long incubation period for falciparum within the mosquitoes. So the idea is, you know, would they have actually bitten 
somewhere here, gotten infected, and then fight again and be able to. And so while we see this really large increase in the you know, projected total population size, it's a much, much younger mosquitoes that we're really seeing out there. Yeah. Um, does this depend on, I, I assume there's some kind of mosquito density dependence underneath uh, this. Um, so I'm wondering kind of what assumptions are you making about kind of where, you know, how the density dependence kind of comes about as a kind of food resource or it's actually for like larval development? We, we put the density dependence in the larval development and it is sort of a, um, you know, classic asymptotic larval density dependence. And it's only in the larval, it's not in the viva stage. Um, is there only a single insecticide or, or is there heterogeneity? Um, you mean like so insecticides that exist? Yeah, but that the resistance is developing against. So, um, and don't quote me on this because the, the, what I'm saying may be a little bit outdated, but I think there are four approved insecticides for use in like proximity to humans, but they're all of the same kind of category. And so the insecticide resistance is sort of broadly that category. And so there just really isn't a lot um out there there may be more recent things that are beyond that but that, that's my understanding is that like the the category the periphery insecticides are what's like essentially approved for human yeah uh, and one more question is that, do you have any anticipated compensatory mechanisms for this intervention the dbh intervention not that i could answer um 20 e is like uh a hormone that does a lot of things. And so um, there certainly is potential and it's possible that my collaborators could answer that question better because they've done a lot more research on 20E that is sort of beyond what we're talking about here. And I do have a slide here if they are there. Yeah. One more question. Um, uh, so I understand how kind of that decrease in survivorship um, uh, you know, TBH actually kind of shifts the age distribution to the younger age classes. Um, why is the total population size uh, larger with TBH versus that? Um, so it's going to be a matter of like the feedback between the density dependence and the larval compartment. So when you reduce eggs and you reduce mating, you also sort of reduce the competition that you see. And so there is a balance. If there's like the shift in mortality, like you're talking about, so there you're more likely to have the younger population, but you're also sort of producing more of that because you pulled back the density dependence in the larval compartment that's sort of being pushed higher up in the standard set. Yeah. Yeah. So when we initially did this, there was a lot of focus, well, not a lot, there was some focus in the lab to focus on like ways to intercept mating. We started doing some of this modeling and you know, like some of the thought was like maybe mating isn't something we want to to change because it ends up having this kind of nonlinear mm -hmm. yeah. um, okay so this is all just on the mosquito population size we then built this into a relatively standard Ross McDonald framework so like I said um, you know on the side of the epi component we're really following that standard uh, formulation but uh, we have this more complicated mosquito component with the whole life cycle built in. And so we use that to think about what would be the impact on malaria transmission. And so again, the figures that are showing the coverage from the like, fraction of coverage from zero to one is on our x-axis. So again, ignore near zero and ignore near one because those are the field aspects of this. And the dark, the uh, more solid lines are, are more effective DDH and are more effective insecticide. Um, and of course, now we have to choose what kind of transmission setting are we thinking about here. So I'm showing you this for moderate, sort of a moderate transmission setting. Um, and in this case, we see sort of a little bit better response for DBH in terms of how effective is it at reducing malaria transmission. And so, you know, the level at which we can, we can really see that, that change. So, and for like low, lower impact PDH or more insecticide resistance, we see kind of similar responses there. If we put it in different transmission settings, say for example, low transmission settings, we still see the same type of pattern where the DDH does as well, if not a little bit better than the insecticide at um, reducing transmission. But when we go to a high transmission setting, then sort of nothing's working particularly well that we're, we're doing, but the DBH again is sort of on par to what we're thinking about. Um, potentially. 
yeah, more work. Um, so yeah, so they're kind of when, uh, I'm kind of comparing the solid lines against one another, like the pink versus the blue, for example, you know, but those are actually different ones kind of the PPH of, of two milligrams, right? Yeah. Or micrograms, right? And one's 100% efficacious kind of line. So are those, can we actually compare those things in terms of magnitude? Because it's kind of like the apples and oranges and things like well, then. Well, this is going to be sort of the last we can do with insecticide. So full efficacy insecticide that we're working with. Um, and this is just, so this is essentially like any time in the model that the mosquito would incorporate uh, interact with the like, side which would be when they're seeing the bed net, then so we're going to see that reduction. I think those are called compact units. Yeah. So, it, it, I mean, obviously, potentially we could change the DBH, but these are the three concentrations that we looked at. And so this is like the maximal DBH that we have to think about. Um, and, you know, there's reasons for the choices of the DBH that are related to the levels of harm that would be in the system. I don't know what those specific but reasons it. are, but <laughs> not at all. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, but and I will say, and I didn't mention this, but that we're assuming that the DBH would be something that you could have a similar interaction, like on a bed net or something like that. So we are instituting that interact that uh, effect in the same way as with the insecticide, which would be like when we would expect the mosquito to contact the bed net. Yeah. yeah. Um, are there uh, probable uh, distri like distributions of coverage for the two interventions? Because um, I guess like the, you know, the DBH is most advantageous, like the blood transmission at forty percent. So I was so it really. So words do you mean that yeah. the coverage would be the sort of like the bed net usage, and that we are instituting both of these via bed nets? So the coverage would be a like the idea would be identical coverage. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And so, sort of given this research, there's some interest from chemical companies to think about could they really develop something like this and put it on a bed net and get it, you know, out to the population. So, just in that direction. Um, so, just to sort of this idea here is that if we disrupt that hormone signaling, there's a lot of different effects that happen. Um, and these are related to a lot of traits that are important for vectorial capacity. But we do see this sort of ecological shift towards the younger female population, which could have additional effects that we haven't looked at here. Um, but it does have this potential to um, substantially re reduce malaria transmission, especially in, in a lower or moderate transmission setting. So that was one idea they had of ways to sort of alter mosquitoes in a different way than insecticide. Um, the second idea that um, what was brought up was actually using an, uh, an improved anti-malarial um, which it targets the cytochrome um, complex in the mitochondria. And so it's, it has a known action against the parasite. It's like I said, mentioned previously, it's a common prophylactic or part of a prophylactic given um, when people travel in malaria endemic countries. Um, and so the idea was, could, could we sort of give this to the mosquito, and by give, I mean um, allow the mosquito to uptake it through the cuticle uh, and have an impact on the parasite within the mosquito. And the answer is yes. Um, but what we also tested, did it change any other phenotype? So we knew, we knew from the DBH work that there was a potential for some things to have an impact on things like mortality or egg laying or mating. But it turned out in the, the context of tilicone, we don't see any of those changes. So we have you know, statistically in, uh, uh, non like statistically the same of um, mortality curves, egg laying, all of that. Um, but we do see that it reduces malaria infection. And so, uh, sort of the experiment that I will be using the data from in uh, in the figures that I'm showing follows from this type of experiment where the mosquitoes are exposed for 60 minutes to a tubercle on a surface, so like they're in a petri dish allowing it to uh, absorb. Then they are given infected blood and allowed to feed um, within sort of a within a 15 minute period following that exposure. And then seven days later, we pass for a particular uh, stage, the oocyst, um, which is about the time when we expect them to be uh, plentiful. In the, and you can see that in you know this experiment I'm showing here, there's a very strong reduction in the infection level that we're seeing. 
Yeah. Is the um, 60 minute dosage for the um, antimalarial, is that like physiologically relevant or do you know how the time was chosen? Um, so we wanted to get them like, so I'm not sure exactly how it was chosen, but it's often been tested for much shorter time periods. Okay. But again, we don't necessarily and you get, like, expect similar yes. results. Because uh, it's really um, great. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, um, I found a slide somewhere, maybe at the end I could show it, but um, with that six minute, and it, mm -hmm. it's very similar on okay. that sense. Okay. Um, the idea, again, is that potentially we could put this on a vet net of some sort, and right. then the mosquitoes would land on that, which they commonly do. Landing for 60 minutes is a little bit. Um, May or may not do that, but six minutes is certainly a very yeah. common time frame that they would sit and wait, and they do often like sit and wait for long periods of time. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, we see similar with a six minute or four uh, experiment. That being said, I think when the sixty minutes was originally chosen, it was like for just like ease, ease, but also um, you know I don't think necessarily we thought six minutes would be as great. Sure. <laughs> yeah. For the process. Oh um, yes. Yeah. Um, so the idea here is that we're in the model going to employ this anti-malarial um, that's going to inhibit. It. We know that it inhibits development of parasites in humans, but uh, the data I just showed is that it prevents the development of infection uh, in blood feeding. We really we saw that complete abrogation. Uh, we also there's also some data that I'm not incorporating into this model about it aborting already begun infection. So if the mosquito is already in, in infected and, and then it lands on that surface, then it, the, the infection uh, sort of ends. Um, but we don't see any other impacts on mosquito, mosquito traits like egg laying or mortality. Or so. But one of the things that we sort of learned from the previous DBH study was that this idea of comparing it directly to insecticides is a little bit false because insecticide treated bed nets are out there and no one's going to take them back and like replace them. So we wanted to think about can we, how would this impact the, you know, if we put it out with insecticides? So I'm um, going to talk to, uh, show some plots that are thinking about the impact of a tobacolon when we vary coverage and insecticide resistance. And the output I'm going to look at is what I call effectiveness, which is one minus the proportion reduction in malaria transmission relative to no intervention. And so in these plots, like yellow means that basically there's no change and dark blue, we're going, moving towards elimination. So if we looked at insecticide alone, as coverage increases and there's very little insecticide, insecticides do really well. We knew that, but we wanted that as like a baseline for comparison. Now, if we were to add a tobacone in the context of insecticide, we see this different picture where obviously we need high enough coverage to really get any um, anything really happening. But there's a you know in the context of insecticide resistance, we see much better push towards elimination. And just like in my previous plots, when the cover coverage is very small or very large, the main field is not going to do a great job at, at doing this. Um, so I think you know a more realistic setting would be somewhere in here where we're we're really able to build upon uh, the impact of the insecticide with this etobicone compound um, as well. And what's happening there is that you know when you have low insecticide resistance, the insecticide is killing the mosquitoes. But when you have Increasing insecticide resistance, the mosquitoes that don't die are not getting infected nearly as much because they are contacting that um, compound that's really preventing the infection. And that makes a lot of sense because, you know, they're, if they were landing on the bed net, it's like in close proximity in time to when they would be biting potentially someone. Um, we also, uh, you know, obviously I've given you sort of one example, but the effect of the tobacone is going to really be dependent on the situation we're talking about. So malaria prevalence, level of insecticide resistance, so forth. Um, and in these plots, I'm going to talk about the enhanced effectiveness, um, which is the prevalence uh, with insecticide and a tobacone. I think this is reversed, actually. I struggle with things being, um, but everything is positive. Uh, so we have these plots, and I will talk through what we're seeing here. Um, the x-axis in these is the prevalence without, the prevalence of malaria without interventions. The y-axis is the enhanced effectiveness. These colors go from um, full insecticide resistance to no insecticide resistance. And then we have a coverage level of 20, 40, 60, and 80%. So one of the things that we see, first of all, is that all of these numbers are positive. So the atomicone is always beneficial. Our enhanced effectiveness is always greater than zero. We also see that when we have higher coverage, 
then we have more benefit to a, a total code. That's simply because there are more mosquitoes that are contacting the total code that we're coming, coming or coming into contact with. Um, we also see that the atopoquone generally is going to be better with higher insecticide resistance. So a lot of the trends here have this um, low uh, higher insecticide resistance, the atopoquone does better. That's again because in low insecticide resistance, the insecticide kills the mosquito, but in the context of high insecticide resistance, they have more opportunity to be exposed to atopoquone. Um, and then we also see that the atopoquone is less beneficial with higher prevalence. So as expected, when prevalence is very high, there's just a lot of malaria going around. So the atopoquone is only able to sort of um, impact a certain amount of those, uh, you know, interactions that we're working with. We also wanted to think about what could, what could be the potential impact in Sub-Saharan Africa. So we took all of the locations with known insecticide resistance across Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, looked at the local prevalence that was in those areas, the local insecticide resistance, and the local bed net coverage, and then put it that in and said what would be the impact. And so, if we have just um, the prevalence relative to what the known insecticide treatment in the area was, and then we see like what's the reduction in that prevalence. And so, our predictions here are that in sort of West Africa, we're getting down to about 37% of the prevalence that we saw previously, and that in East Africa, we could get even lower with the um, 25, down to 25%. Um, and you'll notice that, you know, there's a lot of heterogeneity in our predictions, right? So certain sites are, would be, have no impact at all, and other sites, uh, we would see quite a large impact, and, you know, especially in East Africa, we predict sort of more impact that we're seeing. So this is the idea of like if we put it into the local context, thinking about what are those local levels of insecticide resistance coverage and prevalence, what do we expect for the Seattle West? Um, so I think there's a lot of opportunity here in the sense of the atomic code really known to be able to prevent infection both in humans, but because it's approved in humans, we could potentially roll it out faster to be used on something like mosquitoes. Um, and it has this opportunity to sort of build on the insecticide that's already there because its mechanism of action um, is different. Do you have a question? Yeah. Um, yeah, I have a question about um, so um, kind of uh, underlying kind of um, you know the, the assessment of kind of impact and kind of change in prevalence um, based off of you know, adding ATQ um, on top of kind of um, insecticides. Um, that's all based off of just uh, in terms of modeling. That's all just infection numbers, right? Or prevalence? Prevalence, uh, yeah. Uh, attack rate for kind of, and, uh, or prevalence in terms of actually just like proportion of individuals infected. I'm wondering, you know, as you mentioned kind of in the beginning, um, it seems like, you know, disease cases, if the underlying model is kind of an SIS for humans, right? Mm -hmm. um, that how many previous infections you've had, you know, builds up your immunity. And so, uh, you know, the more infections you've had, kind of the lower your risk of kind of developing the disease, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I'm wondering kind of how it impacts not just overall prevalence, but it presumably would have kind of a more moderate effect on actually kind of disease case, like uh, severe disease cases, right? Yeah, so we didn't look at that, um, but that I think that's a really good point that we're, we're really thinking about what prevalence is and yeah. in the model prevalence is not based on whether we're talking symptomatic or asymptomatic, yeah. it's just like whether it's there or not, yeah. um, but yes. Uh, Presumably, that I would say it's sort of the first order effect you'd expect is to have less impact on symptomatic disease, but depending on how far you can push the, yeah. the it down, then it would be back on whether you're getting to a low enough if you're shifting the sort of end of XP. Yeah. But yeah, I think that's really interesting. And you know, maybe a potential way to connect this better to the next project. <laughs> <project's laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so these two products were joint work with two groups at uh, the Harvard Chan School, uh, Karen Lebucky group and Flamini Pateruccio's group. Um, so lots of other people involved in the, the work that was uh, done here. So um, the DDH work was led a lot by Francisco Kai, who was a master's student at the time, and Evie Kakani um, was a postdoc at the time. And then the the Tobacone work was really the great talent of Keaton in the lab um, with a lot of the spatial modeling done by Ingo himself, who's now a, uh, who's a PhD student in when at the time, but now is a postdoc at. Uh, 
Yeah, so I'll stop here because the next topic that I will talk about is different in flavor. Are there any additional questions to ask? Are there questions online? No, yeah. I, I was just going to say what, what I really like about this is something that, that people have talked about for a while, right? Is that to control disease, you don't have to control the vector, right? And, and so this, I think these are great examples. Like you can try to get rid of the mosquitoes or you can try to get rid of the disease. And I think both of these are really nice because what you're trying to do is, you know, we know those mosquitoes just keep on doing their thing. Um, but you can actually make them less harmful. It's very exciting. Yeah, and I, I, I mean, and I really like this because I think the ideas behind them, which were not my ideas, were really kind of creative ideas on how to, to use information that we already know, tools that are out there. We know 20 e have all these impacts on mosquitoes. We know until one works with humans, like, can we maybe something like that? Yeah. To, to go along with that a little bit, um, I mean, Andrew Reeves talked a lot about kind of evolution through vaccines, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I'm wondering, kind of, I mean, DBH, kind of the first part of your talk, DBH is not a vaccine, right? But it's, I'm wondering whether um, about, you know, going uh, with the opposite point, you know, it's like you're not controlling, um, you know, um, mosquito population size, and for a lot of like evolution proof kind of, you know, vaccines, you're also not controlling kind of, you're not trying to reduce the vector population. It doesn't seem like DBH would be evolution proof. Right, because um, it seems like mosquitoes that would actually um, have resistance to DBH, you know, although they might incur some other costs, you know, it's like they would actually have DBH sensitivity to DBH would actually incur some kind of survivorship cost and a reproduction cost, right? So actually gaining resistance to DBH, you know, um, would would be would give it a, would give those, those mosquitoes kind of slight advantage, right? So it's not evolution. Yeah, I mean, we certainly haven't looked at either of these in the evolutionary context. Yeah. I think there are, you know, questions on the side as well. That's yeah. the key to that um, DDH is a mimic, so a hormone that is naturally occurring mm -hmm. hormones. So I think that, you know, resistance to DDH may sort of push you back towards where you were before, which I think is a little bit sort of evolutionarily different than what you would typically think about, but I think it's a really interesting question. Um, uh, 20, 20E is like a very complicated hormone, so <laughs> it does a lot of things. So it would be interesting to think about okay, well, if it's changing, if DBH is changing factors in different ways, you evolved resistance to different components, how that would impact the cell. Yeah, yeah. Um, the question often comes up on the evolutionary side for the atobicone, you know, like this drug resistance, and would we see that? Uh, it's we haven't specifically done this, but the expectation is there would be less drug resistance appearing in the mosquito compared to what appears in the human. Yeah, so I feel like there's less risk of that end of things, but of course. Under. Yeah. And it, it's it's great because, but I think from from what you showed, it suggests that the drugs that you use against the mosquitoes really stop the oasis completely, right? It's like more like an all or nothing, and I think. Yeah, that would potentially result in less resistance than if it's a gradual thing or just like you're yeah, so what it's really doing is it's carrying yeah. killing the parasite itself. And so exactly. I mean that's what it does in the human, but the thing is that the population size is exactly. much larger yeah. in the humans, so that's why there's more potential for evolution, whereas lucis numbers are generally quite low yeah. in general in the mosquitoes, so yeah. you know, it's easier to yeah, no, but, but I think that helps with avoiding that, that resistance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's cool. And the other thing I was going to say, when I was a graduate student in, at the University of Edinburgh, so this this would have been in 2003, Richard Carter had an undergraduate student for their honors thesis do a pilot experiment to see if you could get rid of malaria mosquitoes or, or malaria mosquitoes by feeding them sugar water with, uh, with antimalarials. And the, Consensus of all the other professors at the time was that was the most ridiculous <laughs> ever. So I will say that it's not that you know any antimalarial would work, and they did test multiple yeah. things, and that the total one was the one that performed well, in part because well, at least all of them were all of these experiments were surface experiments, like mm -hmm. the GOP did, and certain of the compounds just don't cross the critical. So, so this is what happens. So. I mean, yes, I, I can see why people might have skepticism to it, but like I think it's these types of ideas that are really you know, have potential. It, it, I, I think it's just a great lesson. So if anyone ever has an idea and, and the rest of science tells you it's stupid, you know, it's <laughs> go for it.
Getting undergraduates doing it out here. <laughs> no, I'm not. If you believe that's a good idea, you should do it and prove them wrong. Okay. okay, then I will move on to the other part and we'll see how much of this we get through, um, which might be good because there's more equations in the top of that. <laughs> um, okay, so when we talk about um, immunity to malaria or protection against malaria infection, we're really talking about protection against symptoms rather than protection against infection, which I have to say it's much easier to talk about since the pandemic because people understand vaccination that really have, doesn't abrogate infection, but you know changes the level of symptoms. So one of the things that we uh, often see is that um, for early ages, we see a lot of you know severe disease, but as uh, individuals go older, then we see tend to see sort of more mild disease or even you know no infection, but no level of disease at all. And I will say this this curve, this pictorial curve is sort of showing that it's going down, but if we do um, sort of cross-sectional surveys, we see parasite levels that seem quite high, especially in malaria endemic areas. And what we're seeing here is this change is due to sort of a naturally acquired immunity, but immunity against symptomatic disease rather than against infection. Uh, has it been demonstrated that it's actually naturally acquired immunity rather than just an age specific effect like you'd have with in COVID at younger individuals? Just right? in COVID, you know, it's younger individuals have less severe disease, you know, because of their age, not because of you know, So the thing that there have been like cohort studies that yeah. of like children and like the, one of the things that they'll see with children that show less disease but not necessarily less infection is like higher antibody levels of a whole slew of antibodies that respond to malaria but um protection to malaria is a complicated thing it's not it, you can't pinpoint to like oh if you have the antibody against this part of the pathogen you'll do better uh, but children that have more antibodies they have less disease but if I were to, if I had caught malaria and I'd never had malaria before, I'd I'd likely get a very severe case, yes. um, like a, a, yes. a, a, someone in their first year of life. In yes. Saharan Africa. Yes. Uh, overall, I'll say yes. I will give the caveat that the some of the severe disease that you see is so it is age specific in the sense of um, there's like cerebral malaria is one of the main problems for young children. We don't see that as much for adults, but we do see very severe disease, and in fact. Um, we see disease, you know, that's why there's such a strong need to protect, like do prophylactic protection for people that haven't been exposed. But there's also evidence of individuals living in malaria endemic countries that they leave for long periods of time and then come back and they they have much more severe um, episodes than individuals that have been in the malaria endemic countries. So there is, you know, there is evidence that it's naturally acquired. You are correct that there is some age dependence of sort of more mortality, I would say that's more going to see younger children and sort of developmental things mm -hmm. there as well. Um, yeah. We also see a lot of heterogeneity in malaria infections that um, are going to be related to things like age, but also other things like variation in environment that we have. Um, and you know things like seasonality. So I want to highlight a couple things over here in these age prevalence curves. And so you'll see that some of them are very flat with age and some of them are very peaked with age. And so one of the things that we see is that in low transmission regions, we see a much more flat profile where prevalence is sort of consistent um, across ages. Whereas in high transmission areas, we see prevalence being more peaked in younger aged individuals that we're, we're, we're thinking about. And so we're going to sort of, the model is going to sort of loosely show patterns the, of this type, but uh, depending on the transmission setting, we see different um, prevalence profiles with, with age. There's a lot of factors that uh, affect immunity at the population level that we're interested in thinking about. So interventions such as vaccinations or mosquito control, but also things like human movement between different locations that have different potential for disease spread. And of course, environment like seasonality, climate, and elevation. I won't be talking about these at all in this project, but it, it is, uh, they are topics that we're interested in using the models to think about. So the model that we have here is a model that um, has five compartments for the, the human side of things. So the side and three compartments for the mosquito that we're looking at, but on the human side, we're also uh, incorporating age. So it's a partial differential equation or very differential equation joint model. We have partial differential equations to describe all of our human compartments that we're, we're looking at. 
and um, sort of we have uh, susceptible humans, we have infected but not yet infectious humans, and then we have asymptomatic and symptomatic disease that we're working with, and we have a vaccinated compartment that actually is going to consider a vaccination that is sterilizing because the currently licensed uh, malaria vaccine is a sterilizing vaccine. I'll talk about that in a little bit. And then on the mosquito side, we sort of have this more simplistic, susceptible, uh, exposed, and then infectious uh, direction. So to talk a little bit about it, our um, the probability are like our infections. So moving from a susceptible dose into the infection or moving from asymptomatic to um, symptomatic, which we think of as a sort of super infection, uh, like free exposure to the disease is going to be dependent upon the biting rate. And our biting rate is uh, dynamic in that it depends on the time dependent level of both the mosquito and human population that we're working with. Um, and then it's this you know, sort of infectivity level and then the fraction of infections mosquitoes that we have in the population. Um, and then our force of infection on the mosquitoes is similarly going to be related to that dynamic biting rate. And then the fraction of infectious humans that we have where symptomatic and asymptomatic individuals have sort of a different uh, infectivity level that they're doing. Since, it's, since we have age dependence, that ends up having an interval in that force of infection that we're working on. But in addition to the sort of eight compartments I showed here, we're also tracking immunity that we're thinking about. And we're going to track two types of immunity, anti-parasitic immunity. So that's this idea of the RTSS vaccine where we're really stopping the stage from the mosquito into the human, um, really blocking that just the start of the infection. Um, and that's why they get that separate compartment where they cannot be infected for at least a period of time. And then we're also going to think about clinical immunity, and that's going to impact the probability of tran transitions, different types of transitions, like whether you go from being infected to having asymptomatic or symptomatic disease, uh, what's the likelihood that when you are sort of clearing the infection, you fully clear the infection or you clear back to sort of an asymptomatic level, um, and also uh, impacts on sort of the likelihood of super infection to drive you from asymptomatic to symptomatic. Um, and so we're going to track three types of immunity in this model. So we're going to track paternal derived immunity. We know that's really important for protection in about the first six months of life. And so that's going to be entirely dependent upon the level of immunity uh, of uh, individuals of sort of childbearing age in the population. And then we're going to track vaccine derived immunity that's totally going to be related to this specific vaccine that we've involved. And we're going to uh, track exposure acquired immunity. So the level of immunity built up in the population due to the uh, infection, the transmission of infection that's happening. So this is another three partial differential equations that we're adding in to track those um, levels. I have a slide with all the equations that people are interested, but that's not actually in it. Um, and then we have these three uh, feedback probabilities that we have um, uh, that are are going to be modeled by sigmoidal functions. And so this probability of going from exposure to symptomatic disease versus asymptomatic disease, the probability of the super infection, so going from the asymptomatic to the symptomatic with exposure, so the level of uh, force of infection in the population, and then this probability of returning from symptomatic disease to susceptible rather than sort of going back to an asymptomatic level. And all of these are going to be modeled based on the, the total uh, population immunity, which is a weighted sum of the maternal vaccine-derived and exposure-derived immunity. So the, we have a weighted sum of these three compartments um, going into these sigmoidal functions. That, and so we have three sigmoidal functions. I'm just showing one up here to give the idea of what the structure looks like. So dependent upon the uh, total uh, population-level immunity, we're sort of either have uh, we shift those probabilities, um, not like So this model that has our eight partial differential equations and three ordinary differential equations, uh, we've done a lot of math on <laughs> to think about this. So one of the things that we can do here is uh, look at the basic reproductive number. We have a uh, formula for that, which I'll walk through. You guys probably are all very familiar with this, um, but it's going to give us this threshold for disease transmission. So for this model, we can write down um, a specific form for our um, R-naught equation, uh, which is going to be the square root of sort of the mosquito to human 
mosquito to human transmission routes and the human to mosquito transmission routes. So we can really break that down and think about where are all of those components coming from. The square root comes from the fact that it's a two host life cycle, so we have two steps to get back. So we need to think about the one step forward. But one of the nice things is the uh, basic reproduction number is really interpretable here. So we have the bites per day um, that mosquitoes are taking. We have the probability of transmission per infectious bite, the probability that uh, the mosquitoes survive to become infectious. They don't die in that infected compartment, and then their expected lifespan. So this mosquito transmission route is uh, you know, very interpretable. Um, the human to mosquito transmission side is a little bit more complicated, but we can still break down and think about uh, all of the possibilities. And again, the integral comes from the fact that we have H age as a component or working with. So we have, again, the bites per day that a human receives. Um, and then we're going to have uh, dependency on these, the symptomatic and asymptomatic, but not in, instead of the levels of those compartments, what these, what these quantities are really telling is sort of in this con context, the expected time that an age alpha person spends in the symptomatic compartment, which is going to be dependent upon a few things, such as the average time that they're in the symptomatic compartment times the probability that they actually reach it. So we get, you know, you will notice we have those letters that, that represent our supermodal functions coming in here. So we have a, a sort of a lot of nonlinearity built in. Um, our, uh, the expected, sorry, the probability of reaching the DH is going to be related to the expected time that a person spends in the in, like exposed compartment before they get there. And so we can break it down. I will say this data down here is going to be the percentage of individuals that are in the susceptible versus the vaccinated. We can really, I haven't showed you what every component is, but we have uh, an understanding of the mathematics behind each of these. Um, and obviously there's a lot of complexity just thinking about those in the symptomatic. The asymptomatic is even uh, a little bit more complicated because there's multiple pathways to reach that. Uh, I didn't put it in here, but Really, we have one pathway to reach the um, so symptomatic compartment from uh, a fully susceptible population, whereas we have two ways to reach is a asymptomatic compartment, or where you can, you can go directly there, or you can go through the symptomatic compartment and sort of wane back into that. So we have two ways to do it, so that equation becomes even more complicated that we're, we're building up. But the simple idea is that we have mathematically can think about you know, all of these components. We've also done a fair bit of analysis, um, you know, on different equilibria that we're working with. Uh, so I won't talk about any of that. Yet. What we've done is we've taken that model and we have uh, built a simulation scheme to look at that, that, this model. And then we wanted to put it into a particular location and think about trying to answer particular questions. So we've chosen to do a case study thinking about Kenya. And the reason that we chose Kenya is because there was really good data on uh, the vaccine rollout related to the uh, currently licensed malaria vaccine. So a couple other things that we did was look at the mortality and fertility rate in uh, Kenya. And we're actually focused on a particular region in Western Kenya, Western Kenya. And so to give you an idea, like our mortality rate and our fertility rate give us an population age distribution that's very um, skewed towards young ages and um, fewer old ages. If you compare that to, for example, uh, the US or Western Europe, there's a much different age distribution that we see there that's, you know, much flatter for a long period of time. In the, in the uh, so we see very um, young age distribution and we have a growing population that we're working on. Uh, we also thought about uh, calibrating uh, the model using the annual entomological inoculation rate or the EIR, which is really the number of infectious bites per year. Um, what this is is the probability that you know a mosquito uh, biting a human times the level of infection in those mosquitoes times 365. So typically how this is measured is that someone sits and lets mosquitoes land on their arm and then they collect them and they determine if they're infectious or not. So how many infectious bites would you get? Um, so it's extrapolated quite a bit uh, and it varies quite widely for malaria. So the picture that I have here, it may be hard to see, but things from as low as like one up to 700 that we're talking about. So very wide ranges. 
Um, the scenario that I'm going to talk about are sort of our baseline scenarios an R and out of six and the uh, annual entomological inoculation rate of about 84, so some sort of intermediate. Um, and so the we think about wanting to project these immunity distributions with age. Um, and these pictures I'll show you are at uh, the endemic equilibrium with an R naught a little bit lower of four. And the idea here is that um, that dynamic feedback is really important. So if, for example, we looked at just you know a fixed immunity, but it was always a fixed low immunity, um, then we see these very flat profiles with age. You'll notice there's very small changes at the beginning due to maternal immunity. But you may argue, okay, well, you have a fixed immunity, but it's low. What if we had a fixed immunity and high? Well, we've seen, we see the same type of pattern. We just see a distribution that uh, between the classes that's a little bit different. That's, you know, fewer symptomatic, more asymptomatic, but really flat across the age. Um, but if we start to add in that our dynamic immunity, so again, these sigmoidal curves, I've only shown one uh, example of it. We have three of them in our model. Uh, then we start to see these age-dependent patterns that we know are more characteristic of uh, malaria endemic areas are not a four where we're having a, you know, there is transmission going on. And so one of the things that we see is that having these dynamic immunity profiles or immunity relationships, the feedback in there are going to be really important to in the model and seeing the types of patterns we know exist out there. Um, we also see that our age profiles of infection change as infectivity increases. So if we start off with sort of low infectivity, this is sort of thinking about um, uh, how we could change uh, potentially perturb the system. Um, we see sort of this equal level in disease types. And as we increase infectivity, then we see it sort of an early peak in symptomatic disease. And if we ramp up, Infectivity even more, we see a very high peak in the demand disease for, for young individuals that would work. And so we wanted to use this model um, to really think about things like different types of vaccination and, and how that would impact the population. And so uh, the one example I will show you is thinking about the RTFS vaccine, which is the world's first approved malaria vaccine. It was approved in back in October of 2021. So a little over a year now, and there were key pilot studies in Kenya, as well as a few other locations, but we'll be using the data from Kenya. And if you're unfamiliar with the disease, with the vaccine, it's a uh, three-dose vaccine given to children between five and nine months, and now there's a fourth dose for those at 15 months. So it's intended for to prevent um, mortality, morbidity, and really young, young children. Um, and it's not that great, but it's better than nothing. Uh, there's a 40% reduction in malaria episodes across a four year period and a 30% reduction in severe cases across. Them. So there is some impact, but you know, you compare this to say the COVID vaccine, and it's uh, very depressing, uh, especially since it's been so long in the coming. So if we think about with and without RTS of vaccination, we see really small changes in what's happening here. So the picture I have here is our age profiles um, with and without vaccination. So with vaccination is going to be the ones with the circles and without vaccination are just the solid lines. The red is symptomatic, the yellow, the orange is asymptomatic, but you'll notice that really the curves seem almost indistinguishable except for maybe at this small point here and if we zoom in. And so the green bar is where we are, the age period across which we have that vaccination happening. So it is a very narrow age range. What we see is this decrease, the local decrease in the symptomatic infections. Um, so for you know a, a couple years into the future. And then we actually see a flipping of the curve. So there's a slightly higher level of symptomatic infection for sort of older individuals that we're working with. And that's due to the fact that we've sort of perturbed the um, exposure acquired immunity that we have here. Uh, so if we think about these immunity distributions, uh, again, the, um, the, we're looking at our age profiles up to age 15. Uh, and I'm showing here immunity, uh, maternal immunity and exposure acquired immunity. And again, the green bar is the vaccination uh, peer type age range that we're looking at. And so what we see is that have this dip in the exposure acquired immunity. So individuals 
or the population in general is having less exposure that's happening, um, given that the vaccination is happening at a particular age, and that leads to a the vaccine leads to temporary protection, but then this later on flipping the vaccine. And that there um this sort of response is also noted in the literature. There is less worry about um, severe disease at this age versus that age due to the sort of the developmental changes that I was mentioning previous. So one of the things that we'll, with this model uh, that we've added in is this uh, pop, the population immune profiles and the ability to track them in this dynamic feedback way that really seems important for capturing the age dependence that we see there. So other models don't really have this sort of dynamic feedback uh, that's going in. Um, it's able to reproduce changing profiles of malaria immunity under a lot of different directions. Um, and it's able to assess the uh, utility of the currently known uh, or currently licensed vaccine. But there's a lot of lot more um, vaccines that are sort of in the works that change different, uh, have different characteristics. And so we're really interested in using this model to assess other types of vaccine or, you know, in the context of, you know, big cities, small towns, population movement and things like that. So we're currently working on a lot of extensions. So this work is done with a collaborative group that came out of a mathematics research community research workshop that I was co-leading on. And so unfortunately that happened during the pandemic, so it was all virtual. Uh, as you might have guessed from that, but the um, six people highlighted in red here are the uh, people that were involved in this specific project, and we have gone on to, um, you know, continue to work on this. Uh, we actually got to finally meet in person last summer, uh, which was really great, and we have something that, you know, we have another workshop coming up, but we're going to get to meet together again, so that's been, been really fun, um, but a lot of uh, the people here are sort of early career um, which has been really fantastic to uh, And so with that, I want to thank you all for having me and I'll take some more questions. I know we're a little bit sort of running over, but before I do that, I want I do want to highlight one quick thing. Um, I'm co-organizing a virtual mini conference between the Society of Math Bio Mathematical Biology, Mathematical Epidemiology subgroup and the Population Dynamics, Ecology and Evolution subgroup, which will run um, later this month. Uh, one to four Eastern, uh, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. So I highly recommend you look it up if you want to snap the QR code. You're welcome to do that. Um, or you can send me an email and I can, you know, link you to where the information is. But I think it'll be a really great conference and it's really neat to see sort of uh, the, the aspects both on the epidemiological side, but the sort of ecology and evolution uh, side. It's free, uh, it's virtual only. Uh, so I hope that any of you guys will be interested in that. So thank you. For those who need to leave, feel free. And then um, other people want to stay to your questions, they're free to be. Any other questions? I guess 